What's up, SPN family? I'm Steph with Creation, and welcome to our virtual experiences featuring the cast of Supernatural. Just a reminder that the top tipper wins a five-minute one-on-one video meet and greet with Misha right after this panel. So make sure your top supporter information is updated with your current email address. To do that, just look beneath your stage window, and you'll see the top supporter rewards. Go ahead and click scroll to the bottom of that section and click the green top supporter information. If you'd like to tip, click the green tip button on the bottom left hand corner of your stage screen. Okay, our next guest is not only an incredible actor, but he's also created Random Acts, a charitable organization dedicated to acts of kindness, helping people all over the world. Without any further ado, let's welcome Misha Collins. Am I on? I've been told that my mic was live, but am I actually live? Okay, yes, yes, I'm seeing a yes. Um, okay, I'm looking at the, <laughs> I'm already having technical difficulties. In true form, hi everyone, how are you? Um, I, I hope everyone's managing lockdown okay. I have, um, I've gone through uh, peaks and valleys myself. There are times when it feels like, wow, this is such an amazing opportunity to spend time with the kids and learn how to cook things that I've never cooked before. And there are times when I think, wow, this is an amazing time to get away from the kids and stop cooking. And also, everything is hard during a pandemic. You know, I'm a, I'm, I, this is something I know I'm not supposed to talk about out loud, but I'm an actor and very busy actor, very important. So I have housekeeping that comes in and, and a babysitter that comes in and helps with the kids under normal circumstances. Those things go out the window and then I'm, I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I am actually pretty good at washing dishes, but I hate laundry and I won't do it. I just hate, I hate, I will, I will do laundry, that's not true. <clears throat> I love to wash things, put them in the dryer. I just can't stand folding stuff. So my all of my clothes are just super wrinkled. Um, and unless I bribe my children with candy, which is something that I never did as a parent, to fold my laundry, um, which is, uh, it's a really terrible thing to be doing. I'm paying my children in cavities right now. I also, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I notice that uh, the that the quiet and reflective time that I thought that this lockdown was going to bring um, actually never never shows up. Um, so it's been an interesting it's been an interesting time. But I will say I've been talking with the creation staff, um, and we all we all miss each other, and we miss uh, we miss conventions, and we miss seeing the fans in person. And it's funny because when we are, you know, in the full swing of things, doing a lot of live conventions, we see each other and we're like, oh, I wish we didn't see each other so much. I'm so tired and so sick of this, you know. Um, that's not really true. We do always love it a little bit, but sometimes it feels like we're worn out and now we're all <laughs> texting each other like, I miss you. I, I wish we were in the green room right now, throwing things at each other. Um, so. Anyway, that's a, that's a little bit of my download right now. Um, I wish I could see your faces, but I do see some of your questions. And so I'm gonna endeavor to answer some of them. Um, uh, how, oh, well, this, the first question uh, that I'm seeing from Shank, Shanksaholic, uh, Shanksaholic is how are you surviving the lockdown are the kids driving you crazy yet? It's like I anticipated your question. Um, no, the kids are not, strangely, the kids are not driving me crazy. They, um, they're they thriving under uh, this new paradigm of no school and few responsibilities and extra TV time. Uh, I had a conversation with the kids last night where I was asking them, um, 
you know, do you really like watching TV so much? Because I personally, I have, I have kind of a hard time. I can watch, you know, one or two episodes of television, and then I feel like, all right, I'm burnt out. I got to do something else. Maybe I'm just too ADD to stick with it. But I was like, do you guys really like watching so much TV? Because you're always clamoring for, for watching television. Um, or is it that you're just bored to the core? Uh, because your parents haven't set you up with anything else to do. And my son confessed that he actually can focus on watching television better than he can focus on anything. Um, so perhaps uh, perhaps there's a super fan there in the making. Um, <clears throat> I saw a question from Brazil. Oh my God, we have people from Brazil in here? That's amazing. Um, uh, it, the question, it, it's gone now, and I sorry, I can't see your screen name, so... Uh, these questions are coming in so fast. I wish I had stuck with that speed reading class. The question though was, <clears throat> what is your funniest memory from Brazil? Well, um, I was at the first, uh, I was at the first Sao Paulo uh, Comic-Con in Brazil. And it was really intense. There were about 120,000 people. And I don't know if you know this, but Brazilians are not people who are, very emotionally subdued. They show their emotion very vibrantly. And they had a, they had like, they had hired, it was really crazy. Uh, first of all, they, they flew me from the, <laughs> from the roof of the hotel I was staying in to the roof of the convention center because they said it would be too hard to get in otherwise. I was like, what, what are you talking about? But great, that sounds amazing. So then we landed, we went down into the convention hall, and they had all of those like metal police barricades up with the fans on one side and a little walkway for you know the actors and, and vendors to walk in. <clears throat> but they had assigned me like this bevy of you know a half dozen or ten security guards who were all like Brazilian Secret Service. Like they weren't just, you know minimum wage security guards. These guys were super, super well-trained and armed. And, and I was like, this feels like overkill, guys. And then we walked in to, to that little corridor off, off the, uh, <clears throat> those police barricades, metal barricades, and f fans started leaping over the barricades, grabbing onto me and holding. And the <laughs> Secret Service guys were like doing these karate chops to like break their holds from my arms. Uh, it was really intense. So that was like, I had this one moment in my life, which I will cherish forever, where I got to feel like a real superstar. Um, and sometimes when I'm feeling glum, I should remember, I should put a post-it to myself somewhere. Like when, when you're feeling down, remember that time in Brazil when people tried to leap through secret service agents to get to you. Um, it was, I did feel, I have to say, I did feel special. Um, what, uh, uh, Jess Horowitz ha has a great question for me and I so appreciate it. What is the worst acting job I ever had? <clears throat> well, um, where to start? Um, I have a few stories, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you one. Um, it was my first, it was my, it was my second film role and it was in a movie called finding home and finding home uh was a really interesting experience um because <clears throat> i got the call um i was playing the male lead in this movie and uh and i got the call two days before we were to start shooting saying they they want you and you're shooting in maine uh so pack your bags i was in l.a and apparently they wanted me, they didn't want me, like that wasn't their first choice, but their first choice guy dropped out of the last minute. So they're like, well, all right, well, whatever, we'll take that guy. So put me on a plane, flew me out there. Landed, guy picks me up at the airport, hands me a script. He said, there's been some changes. I read the script. I'm like, this is not, this is not the script that you, you, you showed me before. It's a very different script. So I read the script, then the director comes and says, yeah, you know, the script is, is a little different from the one that you saw before. I was like, yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. It's, uh, it's, it's su super Christian. Like, this is a very, very Christian, uh, it's an anti-abortion film. Like, it's, it's about, like, it's not at all the, the sort of uh, seashore uh, drama that, that they had 
given me before, which was a total bait and switch. <clears throat> and then I uh, then I drove <clears throat> across the island that we were staying on and talked to the executive producer who uh, runs an organization called Christian Life Resources. His name is Bob Fleischman. And he is actually just like a thoughtful, delightful human being. We had a really great conversation, made some changes to the script uh, so that it would be like a little bit, it would be a more universal story and also one that I felt I could get behind. And Bob Fleischman, by the way, is still a dear friend of mine. I was just texting with him. He's a truly wonderful human being who happens to be from a very different religious and political end of the spectrum from I from where I am. Um, but so so it started, it was like, all right, that was a strange hiccup. <clears throat> um, but it worked out from in terms of like the messaging of the movie. And then uh, and then I uh, had my first day of shooting and it was a big scene. And we did the first take of, of my coverage. And the director comes over to me and he says, uh, in this very like, he's almost embarrassed to say it, and he says it very quietly, so only I can hear. He says, um, "Misha, um, that was a little. Mm, uh, uh, are you, are you okay?" Which is, by the way, not great direction to give an actor on the first day of shooting on a project. Like, you need to be very delicate with an actor's ego because if I start to fall apart emotionally on the inside, I'm not going to be able to give you a very good performance. So I was like, ah, uh, and wow, just got the message that I was horrible and probably going to get fired. So I was like, uh, yeah. And he's like, okay, you want to try it again? And I said, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, and so he goes back over and he goes, all right, everyone, roll camera. And I said, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Larry, can you just give me one second? Because I had to compose myself. And he said, sure, sure, sure. Everyone, be quiet. Misha needs a minute. <laughs> and that set the tone for what was a complete train wreck of a shoot. It was supposed to be six weeks of shooting, and it ended up being three months. The, cr the crew went on strike at one point. The director was yelling at people all the time. They bring us in, put us through makeup and hair, sit us in our trailer and then not use us for the whole day, then send us home and do the same thing the next day. The director, he was a, he was a total mess. Uh, and at one point, he's yelling at people and threatening to fire them. And then I told Larry, the director, I was like, Larry, if you keep yelling at people, I'm going to quit. So stop yelling at people. And it was, uh, it was a complete fiasco. Mercifully, the movie was not very good, and nobody saw it. So. Um, it uh, it sort of disappeared into the into the vapors of history. I have a knack I'm finding for talking uh, indefinitely. Um, let me see what other questions do we have here. <clears throat> um, will you guys hold on one second? Hold on, I'm, I'm sort of texting with creation at the same time. Um, they they I think we were maybe going to try to pull some people into this. Thing with me we'll see if that works it might not work but we're gonna see if we could actually just have like a little chit chat um, so if you want to chit chat on the screen with me um, just type as fast as you can and hit return as many times as you can <laughs> I'm just kidding I'm saying that because you guys are put, <laughs> typing so fast I can't read any of the <laughs> nobody can read any of these questions I know what I need to do I need to do a screen cap so I can freeze frame something and then find the gosh, <laughs> this is a total cluster F. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can find my screen cap. Um, okay, Gabriel asks, what, <laughs> <laughs> what did playing Castiel teach me over the years? Gabriel, also from Brazil. Um, Wow, it's like there's like a Brazilian invasion happening over this virtual uh, this virtual convention. Um, well, I don't know what it taught me. I think that it taught me that there's something to inherent inherent goodness. Castiel, through everything, his his core personality was one of 
goodness and kindness and empathy. He was trying always to do his best. And even when Castiel was <clears throat> possessed or, or not himself, I think, I think we all always knew that underlying that was this being who was just trying to do his best and trying to do what was right. And, um, and I think I learned that, that that really can be an inherent quality in a human being. I think there really are people who genuinely want to do their best and be their best. And everyone makes mistakes. That's another thing that I learned from Castiel. Everyone's going to screw up, even people who have a North Star of doing the right things end up screwing up over and over again. And you have to pick yourself up and you have to keep trying. I think that that's a, I think that's a lesson that <clears throat> that the show has messaged over and over again for years and years. Um, pick yourself up, try again, pick yourself up, try again. Um, do you guys have this problem with you do screenshots and then you can't find the screenshot? Okay. Um, what is my craziest? This is from Elu Supernatural. I L U. Oh, I love you. Boy, I'm so with with it and hip. I love you. Supernatural says, "What is your craziest travel story?" Oh boy. Um, I don't know even where to start with that. Um, <clears throat> okay, I've got one. I think this might be my craziest travel story. I tell that sometimes I have this problem, um, which is that I tell stories and then people think that I'm lying. I'm not lying. None of this is not a word of this is a lie. So <clears throat> I went to, this is another long winded story. I'm sorry. If, by the way, if, 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 if I was, uh, not just left alone in my room to talk. I think that I would probably not talk as long and it would be less painful to listen to. So my craziest travel story, my wife, Vicki, she was my girlfriend at the time, and I, in 1995, uh, we went to, we wanted to go to Tibet. So we went, first went to Nepal and we did this beautiful trekking trip in Nepal. And then we had gotten, at the time you could not, if you were an American, you could not get a visa to go to Tibet. But somebody had given us the tip that if you get a visa for Beijing, then, then when you cross uh, and, and you're meeting the, the customs agents who are Chinese at the, at the Tibetan border from Nepal, and you present them with a Beijing visa, it sometimes works. So we're like, all right, we did it. And by the way, it was not easy to get the Beijing visa, but we did it. And we did this beautiful trek in Nepal. And then we, uh, and then we took a bus to the border town uh, or to near the border town in uh, between Nepal and Tibet. <clears throat> and uh, we had like 10 miles to go. The bus dropped us off at like the town before. So we had 10 miles to go and we were hitchhiking. We got picked up by these guys in a vegetable truck. And somehow, and I'm not sure how this, maybe, maybe somebody nearby spoke English or something, but we tried to convey to them that we're trying to get across the border. And that we were going to try to hide in the back of their truck. And I think I gave them some money. So we're in the back of their vegetable truck, piled with vegetables, just sort of like this loose open truck with a little cover, but the back was open. And we we buried ourselves and, our, and the bags in the vegetables. And they, we got to the border and these Chinese guards that had like, you know, machine guns, which I hadn't been anticipating, uh, were standing there. And they come to the back of the truck very quickly they find us in the vegetables. Our hiding job was not good. They said, what are you doing back here? And Vicky and I are like, oh, oh did we fall? Oh, did we fall asleep back here? Um, and pretended like, oh yeah, we were planning to pop out at any minute. So then we presented them with the Beijing visas and they were like, okay, go on. Didn't care at all. And we crossed the border into Nepal. We got out of the tr truck, walked into this little town and uh, it was getting late, and so we tried to find a hotel. There was only one hotel, and it really wasn't a hotel. It was like this inn, and it really wasn't an inn. It was like a shack, and it was really dingy. They had two rooms for rent. We took one of the rooms. We're up on the second floor, and they served us some soup, 
which was very viscous and we didn't know what we were eating. And, and then we, we went into our room. But very quickly, we started feeling very sick and not well at all. And so we had to keep on getting up in the middle of the night. <clears throat> the only bathroom was across this mud street. There was like literally sewage running in the street. The only bathroom was across the street. It was an outhouse. We had to squeeze into this outhouse over and over again during the night to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then back in the room, there were rats all running all over the room and they were coming out of these little holes. So I was, I was trying to plug up the holes, but a rat would come out another hole and then find that the hole that they were trying to get in had been blocked. And so then they would get frantic and then run all, like run across us on the bed. It was, I, it was as horrible as you can imagine, except for the next morning when it was daylight. And I discovered that when we were going into the outhouse, they don't, they, they weren't, they weren't using toilet paper there. <laughs> they were just wiping, and then wiping it on the wall of the outhouse. The Tibetans were quite a bit smaller than me. The outhouse was quite small, and there was no way for me to be in the outhouse without touching the walls with my shoulders. It was awful. It was truly awful. I'm sorry for sharing that story with you, uh, but I, I have no filter. Um, here's a question. <laughs> Here's a question that is a little bit less incendiary. Um, what non-SBN show would I like to be a part of if I could? You know, I would love to do something, um, I'd love to do something like House of Cards. Bo Willimon created that show. I thought it was really brilliant. Um, it's about the inner workings of politics in DC and the White House. The show creator, Bo, um, worked on Capitol Hill and actually had real insight into the machinations that go on in politics. And as somebody who's quite uh, interested in politics, um, I would love to get involved in a, an, in a political drama that had interesting and insightful messaging. Um, that's, that's one thing that I'd like to do. Um, <clears throat> Oh, just remembering that there's one thing that I wanted to mention because it's been nagging me and I haven't really uh, had a chance to talk about it. Um, but there's <clears throat> a, a fan online found a photo of me and Jim Beaver and I think Jensen um, doing like squinty eyes, Asian eyes uh, with uh, two a Asian fans that we were taking pictures with. Um, and and is it, it, like making all these accusations that were racist and how could we do that and blah blah blah. And I do want to apologize for not having the the foresight or presence of mind to not do that. But we do like five, you know when we're at these conventions, we're doing five, six, seven hundred photos in a day and moving through a lot of people and often tired from shooting and bleary eyed and uh, and fans ask us to do things and a lot of times. We don't have the right filter, or we're not processing it properly. And those fans asked us to do that. And we were like, okay, whatever. Instead of getting into, no, we're not gonna do that. I'm, I don't, I, I, I assume, I, I mean, I don't remember, but I assume, you know, I thought something like, well, you're Asian, you're asking me to do it. Okay, whatever. Uh, of course it's bad optics. And I apologize to anyone who's offended by that, but I did want to talk about it because I keep seeing like this, this fan keeps harping about it online and putting it every time I post about something, there's this like Misha's a racist comment that comes up. Um, I think the same person though was also saying I was racist against Asians for, um, I posted a, a message to the Chinese followers um, of, of support because Chinese people were being uh, persecuted in America because our president keeps calling the coronavirus the China virus and being really vitriolic and unfair toward the Chinese. So anyway, this person was saying that I was being racist for for uh, doing a message in Chinese because not all Asians are Chinese, but the message was specifically for Chinese people, not for all Asians. I needed to clarify those things because I don't like I don't like um, people thinking that I'm. Uh, you know, I have that kind of ill will. Um, okay. I'm sorry to use up um, this precious time defending myself from slander. Okay. Um, who is the 
Um, Brittany, I think I need more. Oh, I was scrolling in the wrong direction, guys. Um, uh, hi, Misha. <laughs> There's so, there, I'm not going to ask that question because it's also from Brazil. I gotta, I, I'm going to do another screen crap. Screen cap, not screen crap. Now I've gotten myself thinking. Um, okay. Everyone asks about the Winchesters. This is from Winchestlsbn. Uh, everyone asks about the Winchesters, but for you, what is the perfect ending for Castiel? <clears throat> Great question. And I can tell you, uh, Winchestiel, SBN. Is that a, is that a family name? What part of, what part of the world are your ancestors from? Um, I will tell you that the ending that we have uh, scripted for Castiel is a very final ending. It is uh, pretty much exactly what I would have wished for. Um, so I'm going to just tell you that the ending that Castiel, uh, that you will see for Castiel is the ending that I would have uh, wanted. Um, <clears throat> oh, Robo OT said, did you see that photo of you on Twitter? Will you address that? So I guess I did address that. Thank you for broaching the topic. I hope that I satisfied your uh, curiosity. Um, OK, I have to do another screen crap. Screen, I, why do I keep saying screen crap? Um, OK. <clears throat> when uh, Aklisha uh, says, when are we getting a new cooking video with me and the kids? Good question. Here's the problem with the kids. They've grown self-conscious of the camera. And they also, West now wants to know what view counts we have, which makes me really uncomfortable. He's like, how many, how many, how many loves did we get? And I don't, I don't want him to start thinking like that because that's, um, that's how we grownups think. So I'm a little bit trying to insulate them from that sort of thing. Mason is still young enough that I can exploit her without her realizing that she's being exploited, which is nice. But I think that that, that ship is about to sail. So uh, we'll see. I'm not sure. I might have to I might have to adopt some younger kids and start over with that whole endeavor. Um, <clears throat> Wayward Nupsi. Uh, I guess that's an Indian name because she or he is asking, would I like to do a convention in India? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, either you're Indian or you live in India. Uh, wish We wish to meet you too. I would love nothing more. I've been to India. Um, actually, it was on, is that the only time I've been there? Yes. Uh, it was on that same trip that I was just describing. And I found India to be truly magical. Really loved it. Um, my wife has been three or four times. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a place that I truly cannot wait to come back to. I was working on an idea for a while, which I may, um, I may resuscitate, um, which was an idea uh, about a crossover um, Bollywood movie. So it would be a movie that appeals to both American and Indian audiences. I can't tell you what the, um, what the narrative arc of that is because uh, I, it's pure gold and I know that you would steal it but I, I have been uh, percolating on something. Uh, that would be so fun. I, I'm, I'm enraptured, enthralled by, um, by Bollywood. <clears throat> um, here is a question from Amanda CW. Does either Dean or Cass consider themselves to be a fatherly figure to Claire Novak as they are to Jack. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we we had episodes where we touched on like that fathery, fatherly nurturing relationship uh, that Cass has anyway toward Claire. 
in this uh, in this season. Um, we didn't get deep into it. Um, Catherine Newton has gone on to become quite a movie star, so I think we we sort of lost her as as a cast member to bigger and better things. But um, but we did talk about her in Abstentia and do uh, I, I do think that that was an impo very important relationship for cast. But Jack Jack for both Dean and Cass and Sam uh, solidified as like the true the true child son figure um, in the show. Okay, um, how are we doing? Um, <clears throat> if I, this is a question from Jen Love 72. Um, if I could have one angel power, what would it be? I would love to be able to, I mean, there's so many things, if you think about it, there's so many things that Castiel could do in the beginning, and he lost all of these incredible powers. Castiel could try, could time travel. That's so amazing. I would take that. Um, I mean, it, I, it traditionally took a little wind out of him. He was unconscious for a little while after time traveling, but still pretty cool. Um, I would love to go back and like tell my parents what not to do, and things like that. It would really Castiel, if I were, if I had that power, I could go back and I could, um, I could also be like protective to the younger me against the various bullies that I came across in my childhood. Um, and of course, you know, this is very traditional uh, and kind of low hanging fruit. But I could also do a little bit of cursory research and then go back in time and, and pick winning lottery tickets, which is something that we've all wanted to be able to do at some point. Um, all right, I'm gonna try to read one of these questions as they go by. Hi, hi from Greece. Um, somebody, nope, uh, nope. Simply cannot read them. Um, okay, <clears throat> uh, this is from Moose Squirrel Art. If I could relive any moment from my life, what would it be and why? What a beautiful question. Um, what a beautiful question. I, I'm, I'm actually having this uh, almost montage flashes of different beautiful little moments in my life. Um, <clears throat> one of them was while I was working on Supernatural. It was the birth of my son. I was equally overjoyed with the birth of my daughter, but I just have this very vivid memory of um, <clears throat> It is in vogue because it has been proven to be biologically and behaviorally important for infants to imprint on their parents. And one way you do that is you have skin-to-skin -skin contact. Almost as soon as the as the baby is born, you want that that it, that child pressed up against your skin. So West was on his mother for a moment, and then he was crying, and there were other things to tend to. So I took him and I held him without my shirt on on my chest. And I sing, uh, I sing "Summertime" to him, and it is that that it, that's probably seared in my memory as like one of the most precious moments. And even just being in the room of you know of having a birth, <clears throat> but when it's you know your own child, it's very poignant. But there's there's this ecstatic joy that permeates the air, and. Uh, and, and combining that with like the first contact with my infant son, my first child, um, and then singing the song that my dad sang to me when I was a toddler um, was a very lovely moment that I would like to relive, I think. Um, Nisha, that's so sweet. Aww. Oh, hi, Steph. Well, hi, Misha. Well, you know, I'm here to tell you that we have randomly selected a fan to come on screen and ask you a question. Are you ready? No, not at all, but I'll do it okay. anyway. This is all my <laughs> fault, so let's do it. All right, let's bring on Stacy. Hi, Stacy. Hi. Hi. By the way, I have to tell you, when I pull my knee up like this and you can see that it's, it's naked, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, on Zoom calls, they're like, oh, I'm naked. Uh, I'm not wearing pants. But you can see that I'm really not wearing pants. So I just wanted to be let you know that I'm really one. All right, now I'm gonna just set the record straight. Okay, I am wearing shorts. 
Um, how are you, Stacy? and where are you, and what's going on in your life? Um, I'm in Illinois. Okay. Um, and I, I'm still doing GISH for the first time this year. So. Oh, how's that going? Good. Um, I have a great team this year. Do you? But yep. it's the first time, right? Yep. So you don't know if it's a great team. It actually could be a terrible team, but you have no basis, actually, you have no basis of comparison. All um, great teams could be infinitely better. I don't know. We've done a lot of uh, challenges so far, so. Okay, I'm messing with you. With I know. I know. To do, I'm sorry to say. Um, From what I'm reading on Facebook, we've got a good team. Okay, good. How was uh, <laughs> what what uh, what have you created? Um, I did the barrier feelings, um, the mask, and the calendar for your favorite actor. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Was that Jared Padalecki? Mm-mm. Jennifer. Ah, damn. Um, what is your question? My question is, what is your favorite dish to cook with Mason? What is my favorite dish to cook what? With your daughter, Mason. Um, such a good question. Um, Mason is so delightful in the kitchen. She loves to experiment with things. Um, what have we cooked recently that's been, I mean, I love, I love things that she, like I love making pizza with her because you can put on whatever toppings you want and she always comes up with something totally weird. I made a video once of her doing that and she ended up putting, and it wasn't like I'm, try, I, I'm trying to prompt her, like do something weird for the, you know, for the fans. She's like, let's put a slice of watermelon and some eggs. <laughs> Crack some eggs and slice of watermelon. It was actually very tasty. Um, but Mason also, really likes to make sweet treats. I think that the most fun we've had in recent memory was making a birthday cake for a friend. <clears throat> I was like, it's, birth you know, it's our friend's birthday, we gotta make a birthday cake. They decided, West and Mason decided they wanted to make a seven layer cake. So we built, we made seven layers of cake, but each one had different food colorings in it. So each layer of cake was a different color. And then they created this frosting. <laughs> It was their own recipe that literally looked like somebody had vomited on the stack of cakes. And uh, they were so proud of it and thought that it was like so beautiful and so delicious. Um, it's an interesting experiment with cooking with kids. When, they're, when they participate in the cooking, they're almost always, they're always more, more interested to try it, but they're almost always proud of what they've made, no matter how catastrophic the creation. And uh, and it does show an interesting thing. Like they're they're not yet at the at the point in life where they feel bad about themselves. Like they they don't they're not yet overcome by shame. I if I had made that cake, I'd be like, oh god, what have I done? It's a disaster. You're gonna hate it. I'm sorry. I tried. They make it, and they're like, look, isn't this beautiful? I made this. Isn't that amazing? Um, so it's it's an interesting fleeting glimpse into the precious uh, innocence of childhood. <laughs> any other questions? Do you have any other follow-up questions? No, nope, that's all. Very nice talking to you. Have, you. have a good rest of your evening in Illinois. Um, Steph, do you, do you have other people you want to um, patch in or, or should I just keep, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to keep talking and then um, I will, if, if you want to bring anyone else on, just bring them on, all right? That worked very well, though. It was like this incredible technological feat. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, what other questions do we have here? I do another one. So I'm going to ask a question from... <clears throat> This is from Camille Oliveira. Um, Misha, how do you feel about one of the stages at the end of the series, and what do you intend to do after SBN is over? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. You mean like one of the stages where we shoot, or just being in the stage of being at the end of Supernatural? I'm going to uh, assume that you're talking about the uh, the 
stage of being at the end of supernatural, stage in time rather than stage in physical space. Um, I, to be honest with you, it's an interesting thing because we're going back to finish the series right now. An episode and a half left to shoot. And, <clears throat> and yet we've taken four months off and is that true? Yeah. Um, and, and in that interstitial time, it's a big word, but a good one. I think we've all had this interesting experience of actually mourning the end of the show. <clears throat> I had a conversation with another central cast member um, right after we went home for, for quarantine and we were both kind of shell-shocked and way sadder and way, uh, way more at sea than we had expected to be. Um, it felt like this thing that had been such a cornerstone, such an anchor in our lives for so long was suddenly gone. And it was just, just a matter of like not, not having that, that cathartic moment of rapping having a rap party and saying goodbye to everyone. It was like, you're done. And that abrupt, that abrupt finish was really hard. I'm sure it would have been hard anyway, but it felt, it felt like not having that proper ceremonial goodbye made it really tough. And it took, I, it took us a while to recover from that. But then we went through a process of mourning the end of the show and figuring out what the next phases of our lives were going to be and, and, and percolating on the question of what we want to do next. And not that I personally have come to any decisive conclusions there, but I have, I feel like I've mourned the end of the show already and celebrated the, the decade plus that I spent on the show as well. Um, so now, uh, now it's an interesting little, it almost feels like a reunion rather than the end of the show, if that makes sense. It feels like we're going back and it's going to be like a big hug and say goodbye to everyone and say I love you uh, and stay in touch, but it's not its not going to be quite the same as it would have been if we had barreled through the finish. Um, hi, Misha. My name is Bruna. What are your projects after the end of Supernatural? Um, Charpad Diary is your handle, but I'm, I'm gonna assume that Bruna is a nickname. Um, <clears throat> Bruna, thank you for asking. I have no idea. I have some, some projects that I'm working on right now. One is trying to work really hard to get people to go vote in the November elections in the US. I think it's really important people vote. Um, I. So that's been something that I've been putting a lot of thought and energy into. Been trying to put some energy into my kids, um, trying to get them to remember who I am. Um, I've been wearing a name tag that says dad, so they can get it like, oh yeah, that's who that guy is that's in our house. Um, and I'm in the process of finishing a book of poetry that I intend to publish if I can find someone to print it for me. Um, I think I will be, I think I'm going to be submitting that to publishers this month. And, um, and then, yeah, I, my other big project right now is figuring out what I want to be when I grow up and what I really care about and what I want to do next. I know this isn't therapy, but might as well kill two birds with one stone. Um, <clears throat> Giovanna Souza asks, what is the greatest teaching I will take from Supernatural for the rest of my life? Um, <clears throat> I think, I think there was, uh, there was a lesson, this is, I, I'm sure there are many, many lessons that I will take from Supernatural, um, but I'll give you two. <clears throat> One was, Work hard, don't complain, do your job. It was really interesting to, to work on something that was so 
arduous. It was a long, there were long days, many, many times. And the crew on Supernatural worked so much harder than us actors. We always had our trailers to go back in to warm up and relax. There, of course, were very hard days for us. But the crew was there 12, 14, in the, in the beginning, 16 hours a day, working tirelessly five days a week, never complaining, never showing up late, never dropping the ball. No one on the crew dropped the ball. I mean, every day someone would mess something up, but it would be quick and it'd be fixed, and everyone knew that they had 120 other people depending on them to keep the ball rolling. So everyone did their job and they did it well. And that work ethic, was it was almost like being in a platoon. I mean, it, it was a really intense work environment. And that work ethic, uh, I actually feel like changed my hardwiring. I think I'm a different person now because of, of being in that environment. Um, and the other thing that I think was an interesting evolution for me on Supernatural actually happened in, not on the set, but in my interactions with fans. When I went to my first fan convention, I had this idea that I was like gonna cultivate a certain stage persona, that I was gonna like present myself as like this cool guy, or I don't even know what I was thinking. I mean, of course now that you hear me say it, that's absurd, like me, presenting myself as a cool person is laughable. But at the time, I'd read this book <clears throat> on Marilyn Monroe. It was a history book on Marilyn Monroe about how she had cultivated her public persona. She had cherry picked from every starlet of the era. She picked her hair color. She picked the shape and size of her nose job, which she got. She picked the dialect accent affect that she used and the way she moved everything that about her public persona was cultivated and that's what catapulted her to the stratospheric success was one of the arguments of this book and so i thought i should do the same thing and i think there are a lot of actors who have successfully done that like actors that many actors i have met who are very different people when they're on stage in front of an audience than they are in the comfort of uh, of a private conversation so I tried to do that the first time I went on stage and the first time I did interviews and I felt like, oh no, I feel like I'm suffocating. I feel like I, I, I couldn't, I, I, I could barely get a word out. I wasn't, um, I was even more inarticulate than I am now. And I realized I can't do this. I have to just be myself. And if that doesn't work, it doesn't work. But this, this whole notion of trying to present a cultivated representation of myself to these, this audience of strangers is going to kill me and I can't do it, so I'm not gonna try. And it was incredibly liberating and definitely something I learned, not from Supernatural, but from the experience of being on Supernatural and the subsequent interviews and panels and interactions with fans. So I keep banging the table because I seem to have dragged this incredibly heavy table uh, to put this laptop on so close to me that I can't sit in the chair without banging it with my knees, but it's there's too many things on it for me to move it while I'm doing a panel. So sorry for all of the dynamic action. I hope you're not getting seasick. Um, all right, I am going to revisit this little box. Hi, oh, 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 hello. Hi, Hi how are you? Look, we Hi. should look fantastic. We are Thank actually- Thank you so much, Steph. This is great, thank you. Do you have any parting words for your adoring fans? Um, I have missed you, Steph. It's it's true. It's like, really, it. I. It's funny, like being uh, being away from doing the conventions with you guys. It's it it makes me realize how much how much I appreciated seeing you and and chit chatting um, in the bowels of hotels across cities in America. So well, we miss you too. Yeah, I, I hope uh, hope we can get through this pandemic someday and get to see each other in person. But it's nice to see your face, uh, even if it's in two dimensions. <laughs> you too. And on behalf of uh, the Supernatural family, we are all sending you a big virtual hug. Thank you so much. Thank for you, Alicia. Bye, Me you guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'm gonna move my table now. All right. Thank you once again. Thank you. You are truly one of our favorites. 
tipping is now done and we're going to bring you the results in just a few moments. But first, make sure you're signed up for our email list at creationent.com and follow us at creationent on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for announcements on more virtual content to come. We are going to be back tomorrow with our one and only, our beloved, our beloved Winchester brothers, so you don't want to miss it. Okay, and our winner is Lisa Kraft. Lisa Kraft, you are our winner. We're gonna contact you via email right now, so check your inbox. Also, Lisa, hang out in this chat for a little bit just in case we have an issue sending you your link. And for those of you who are joining us for Jared Jensen's Q&A tomorrow, we'll see you then. For the record, in case you didn't see me jump, that scared the shit out of me. <laughs> CW actor collapses dead from a heart attack. <laughs> after, after girl asks question, <laughs> spikes the mug. Uh, okay, so the uh, the answer to your question is.